Hi, Dr. Bada. Good morning. Can you unmute yourself, please, Dr. Bada? Right, still haven't figured it out yet. Okay, there perfect. We go. And Dr. Weinberg, if we can have you stop sharing your screen. Yep. See. Are you able to share your screen, Dr. Bada? Um, not yet. You can still share. Let me try again. No. Let's see. Dr. Weinberg. All right. Oh, perfect. Sorry about that. Awesome. you should be able to share your screen now. Okay, I think it's loading right now. Okay. All right, everybody, this is Dr. Bada. Dr. Bada is a vascular surgeon. Um, he is a graduate from Yale. He works with us at Waterbury Hospital and St. Mary's Hospital. Um, Dr. Bada, everybody has their video turned off, but you know, if you ask questions, people, we will unmute ourselves and um, participate. Oh yeah, that'd be great. Um, yeah, I've been doing this for the, I think we, the last three years, so it's been good. I, I always like the in-person ones, so still was getting used to the online ones. But um, you know, I have more questions in mind, so feel free to just like type in things that you want to say, or go ahead and, and uh, unmute, and, and just like Sue said, and uh, go ahead and talk about them. Um, so. You know, so this is the uh, vascular surgery, you know, all of it in an hour. We're not going to try to do everything, but, you know, um, just, you know, kind of get you in the mode of uh, listening to some vascular questions and then just kind of guiding how to think about them. Um, because really with vascular, you know, it's reconstructive surgery, as you can see the picture here. And so the same principles really apply to almost everything. So as long as you can think about them the right way, you can answer most of these questions. Um, it's only 4% of your uh, of the category weight of your test, so maybe you can just kind of sit back and enjoy some of the pictures and uh, some questions here. So this is the SCORE curriculum. You know, I broke it down here into there's ultrasound, endovascular principles, and then there's, you know, arteries are too big for aneurysm, or arteries are too small for occlusive disease, and you can see all sorts of diseases associated with each. You always ask a little bit about venous disease, you know, and um, and uh, vascular access, and then kind of separately there's vascular trauma, which um, I'm sure you'll get in your trauma lectures as well. But we can briefly mention things and include in their fasciotomies. So vascular biology. Um, so we'll start off here with a question about patho uh, pathophysiology of cigarette smoking. What does it do? Is it decreased plate decreased platelet adhesion, decreased permeability of the endothelium, endothelial damage, or increased nitric oxide availability? And if you just, uh, it's basically endothelial cell damage. So 
you know, you don't really need to know that particularly, but just it shows that if you know the layers of the artery, you know that the first line is the intima, and that's what's going to be affected. So the intima median adventitia, most of you guys are familiar with that from medical school, but it is important because if you know the layers, then you can answer questions like this, which we get because of uh, atherosclerosis and the stages of atherosclerosis. So it says, which of the following is reversible in plaque formation? Atheroma, fibroatheroma, fatty streak, or intermediate lesion. Um, and uh, again, the first layer that's affected is the endothelium. That's the one that can be reversed, and that's fatty streak. And um, the classic picture of the stages of atherosclerosis, the six stages, we have to know them well. Um, and it's really not until you get to atheroma, fibroatheroma, and complicated lesion that you start getting disease process in like the end organ. Um, ultrasound, you know, I don't think that they're, they're looking for you guys to know the ultrasound um, specifics, but just that it is a good and uh, useful tool in vascular. And if there are questions that ask about further testing, ultrasound is often the answer for vascular. So here's a good one. A uh, 38-year-old woman presents with swelling in the left calf and ankle, worse at the end of the day. She has no swelling in her foot. She has sensation of bursting pressure in her calf with prolonged exercise. The lower extremity duplex ultrasound shows no reflux or obstruction in her femoral, popliteal, or saphenous veins. The most appropriate next diagnostic test would be, would it be exercise, ABI, segmental, PVR, lymphocytography, or CT venogram? I really like this question because um, they tell you only what you need to know, and um, it's an interesting one. So just kind of picking through it and how you would read a vascular question, you know, young, 38 for, you know, it's vascular, so 38 is very young, so, um, and it's uh, ankle swelling, that's worse at the end of the day, so first thing I think is venous. She has no swelling in her foot, so what does that tell me? Well, it's not lymphedema that goes to the foot, so it's still likely venous. She has sensation of bursting pressure in her calf with prolonged exercise, that's called venous claudication, so still thinking venous. And now they show me the venous ultrasound, it says no reflux or obstruction, there's no DVT, there's no venous reflux. So now you have to think of the more unusual things that cause venous disease. Well, an ABI is arterial, so that's not helpful. PVR is an arterial test, it's not helpful. Lymphocytography is for lymphedema, so it's a CT venogram, and what are they getting at? Lerner syndrome, which is a compression of the iliac vein um, from the contralateral iliac artery. It has to do with the anatomy and the crossing of the iliac veins and arteries of the pelvis, um, but it does cause this syndrome, Mayther syndrome, now predominantly treated with stenting. Um, so the non-invasive criteria, like I said, they're not gonna have you do the Doppler equation or any of that, um, I just think they, uh, want you to know that um, most critical stenoses in vascular are decrease in diameter by 50% or area by 75%. Um, I think that one thing is um, carotid disease because it's often treated in general surgery. So I think they really do want you to know probably the criteria for carotids. Um, there's so many out there and so many different um, ways of looking at carotid criteria. I think the consensus criteria is, is great because it's a consensus of multiple specialties and it's very simple. So they break it down to mild, moderate, and severe carotid stenosis, which is less than 50%, greater than 70%, or in between. And the only criteria that you can just memorize real quick is that peak systolic velocity, 125 and 230. So if it's less than 125, you have less than 50% stenosis. It's greater than 230, you have greater than 70% stenosis, and in between is in between. You can also look at the ratio of the ICA to CCA, and you can also look at the end diastolic velocity. A lot of surgeons use end diastolic velocity of greater than 100 as a reason to operate because you know it's a severe stenosis. But if for the test, you know, 125 and 230 peak systolic velocities are your cutoff parameters. Another test here, another question here, 72 year old man with diabetes, referred for PAD, no rest pain, no wounds, no gangrene, 
but he's got uh, ability to walk is limited by fatigue, no pulses, normal renal function. Um, the ABI uh, shows um, greater, um, greater than 1.4 and total regular index greater than 0.7 bilaterally. Most appropriate next step, you can think about it here, there's no further vascular imaging indicated. You can get a duplex, CTA, or selective angiogram. You know, what disease does he have? It sounds like claudication. So no further imaging indicated for claudication unless you know, it's, uh, it sounds like it's not lifestyle limiting. Um, so, and also it just goes over the ABI criteria here. 1.4 is abnormally high. So it's not abnormal. It's not normal if it's better, if it's greater than 1.0, you know, it's abnormally high. And so um, that's just medial calcinosis. You can get that, you know, um, elevated ABI with severe PAD. Uh, I mean, still, you should say the patient should have medical therapy, and uh, it's a cardiovascular risk factor they have a, if they have PAD. ABI PVR, I'm sure you guys have done them in the trauma bay, you know, for uh, loss of pulses, but um, ABI, um, you know, just done with DAPA probe and a manual sphemometer with the patient lying supine, both arms, both legs, and both pedal pulses, ABI, P, uh, the DP, and the PT. And then here's the interpretation. You can see greater than 1.3, you have non-compressible vessels. It means medial calcinosis. Doesn't really tell you much about the flow um, because it's basically an indeterminate test. 1.3 to 0.9 is normal. And then mild is down to 0.7. Moderate is down to 0.4. Severe is less than 0.4. If they're asking, if the podiatrist is asking if they have enough blood flow um, to heal a, a toe wound, get a toe pressure, if it's greater than 50, then that's adequate. Um, you know, handheld Doppler, really all you're going to hear is the phasicity, which doesn't tell you too much, but if you have a triphasic flow, you have normal arteries without medial calcinosis and without occlusion. The duplex criteria, they have them for each part of the body. Um, again, I don't think that they're going to ask you this, you know, but the renal artery peak systolic cutoff is 180. For critical and the mesenteric arteries, the celiac is 200, SMA is 275. So there, there are numbers out there. So you can use duplex to find, you know, stenoses, not just CTA. And then for endovascular intervention principles, um, you know, it's uh, minimally invasive, but it can be pretty um, invasive and cause a lot of harm. You know, so this is a closure device here probably the riskiest part of the procedure at the end when you put the closure device in. Here's one of these angio seals, a terrible device, and you can see some of the complications that I've seen from it. Um, anyway, here, here's the uh, a questionnaire factor associated with a low risk of arterial access site pseudoaneurysm after an angiogram for intervention. Is it ultrasound guided access, calcified vessels, female gender or obesity? You can imagine everything's more difficult in obesity, so it's not that. In vascular, females are generally higher risk because of the smaller arteries. Calcified vessels make things more difficult, so ultrasound guided access is the only one that's helpful. And um, they just go over the technique here of how to do an ultrasound guided femoral access. Um, so here are, is why you use ultrasound, and here's why you access over the femoral head. And you access the common frontal artery over the femoral head so that you can hold manual pressure. If you access too high, you will likely not see bleeding at the end of the procedure because all of the blood will go into the retroperitoneum, you know, the massive retroperitoneal hematoma. If you go below the femoral head, you likely will see bleeding, but you'll be unable to stop it adequately and you'll create a pseudoaneurysm just because you can't hold over the femoral head. And, um, this picture here shows the green circles around the femoral head. You can see someone's access site here. And, um, and then you can see actually a uh, iatrogenic fistula into the femoral vein immediately there. So that can happen. This is from a, a cardiology assessment, uh, both left, um, both um, arterial and venous access. They often need both. And here's a, a safety question um, about radiation. You're performing an angiogram. You want to, and um, 
you're standing next to the x-ray source, you want to decrease your exposure by a factor of 16. How far away should you stand? 2, 4, 8, or 16 feet. Um, decreases by inverse square, so it's 4. So anything, um, you know, you want to, or any distance that you go, that distance squared is your decreased uh, radiation exposure. So distance is really the best way to decrease your um, exposure. The ways to decrease exposure are, you know, using shielding in the room and just not using as much x-ray, you know, not just stepping on the pedal the whole time. And then there's also, besides radiation, the other dangerous thing we give in those procedures is contrast. So always looking for contrast nephropathy. If you see an AKI, usually in post-op day three, it's likely related to um, creatinine, uh, like, um, contrast uh, use, which can be, um, prophylaxis some benefit from, from hydration pre and post. All right, we'll get into some of the diseases here. Aneurysms, there's an aortic aneurysm, pre and post repair. Uh, and that's what you see there in the middle. So risk factor, that's protective against formation of aneurysms. You don't think of many things as being protective. Male, you know, smoking, it's like they're not gonna be smoking. Diabetes, you usually think of a bad thing. Doxycycline used to be prescribed for aneurysms, which show no effect. Diabetes, it's actually diabetes is protective against aneurysm degeneration. Pretty interesting. What is an aneurysm? Just a dilation of a blood vessel, 1.5 times the, the normal size vessel. Actasia is when it's greater than one times normal, but less than 1.5, so it's uh, an almost aneurysm. A pseudoaneurysm is just that, it's a false aneurysm. There's no arterial wall layers. It's just a contained rupture, usually the subcutaneous tissues. And why do you get aneurysms? They're degenerative, multifactorial, infectious. You know, most of it is uh, smoking, family history. Uh, males are more predisposed to it than females, and they degenerate with time. And COPD is another independent risk factor. Natural history for a central aneurysm, as you know, is rupture. Peripheral aneurysm is actually thrombose and, and shower emboli. Here's the sizes and the natural history, and they figured out which size ruptures went. Um, so we usually treat between five and five and a half. So you can see that's when the risk of rupture dramatically increases from 1% to 5 to 10% which is, you know, set by the, uh, the risk of, of uh, open surgery back in, and they did those predominantly, the risk of open surgery were equivalent, you know, they're about 5%, so that's why we did it. So when do you treat them? So we said for asymptomatic, it's, you know, five and a half for males, five for females or patients who have a family history or COPD, because um, they tend to um, expand rapidly or rupture with COPD. Uh, if they're symptomatic, they're treated at any size, if they're infected, you're treated at any size, or if there's growth of greater than a centimeter in a year or half a centimeter in half a year, you're treated at any size. You can treat aneurysms open or endovascular, and you want to assess for their comorbidities to kind of choose the best treatment for them. So here's a question related to aneurysms. A 70-year-old male underwent repair of a seven centimeter aneurysm with aerobiliac graft, so open. He had loose bowel movement post up day one with blood in it. Vital signs are 100.5, heart rate's 100, BP is soft, and his urine output has been 10 cc's an hour. His white count is 25,000. He underwent a flex sig for evaluation. Here's the image. You get a little general surgery here. You get to see this image in the flex sig. What does it look like? And what would you do for it? Well, emergent abdominal exploration fluid resuscitation, anticoagulation, vancomycin PO. I think the vancomycin PO is trying to say maybe you don't know what a flex sig looks like, and this is pseudomembrane, this is not pseudomembrane, this is transmural ischemia of the colon. So, um, emerging abdominal exploration. You can't really put a scope in and take a look because the patient just had a laparotomy from an open aneurysm repair. Um, and so it's emergent abdominal exploration because there's, um, this is a colon ischemia from an uh, abdominal aneurysm repair. And, um, you know, why ischemia? Well, here's, you can see here on the right the picture of um, 
an aneurysm repair. It looks like it's retroperitoneal. And you see the IMA there, and they've got the right angle around it. Right, you have to ligate the IMA, and um, and then do your aneurysm repair. Um, now, when you ligate the IMA, there's things um, that you should do. You should assess it. You know, if you probably have a pre-op CAT scan, but even still, when you ligate your IMA for an open aneurysm repair, you check the back bleeding. And if there's brisk back bleeding, it's okay to ligate. That means there's great collateral supply. If there's poor back bleeding, that means that the colon is likely dependent on that IMA flow. So you should re-implant the IMA at the end back into your graft. Um, picture on the left just shows the exposure. I love this picture from Wynn where the guy's gently picking up the duodenum and doing a little peekaboo for the aorta. But um, it's, you know, that duodenum takes some abuse under the clamp. But you'll see the renal vein there, the left renal vein um, crossing the aorta. And that's your exposure for your for renal transabdominal. So those are the two exposures here on the left and the right, transabdominal and retroperitoneal. Um, you know, just some considerations, you know, for other complications of the clamp time, super renal is greater than 35 minutes. You have to worry about uh, end organ malperfusion of whatever vessels are distal to that. So if it's above the renal arteries, um, uh, renal injury, if it's above the mesenterics, mesenteric ischemia, um, repairing your iliacs, and like we said, assessing the IMA for reimplantation. So uh, open AAA complications, and this is for non-ruptured, is really 71% complication rate. Now some of those are pretty minor, but it, it is a pretty morbid procedure. Um, you know, some of the complications to look out for, because these are things that they'll probably ask you. Predominantly it's pneumonia, it's just respiratory failure, which is why um, sometimes a block is helpful. Um, am I bleeding, renal failure, colon ischemia, lower extremity ischemia, all that thrombus, sometimes um, when you clamp showers. And spinal cord ischemia is rare just for inferior. It's usually for a thoracoabdominal aneurysm. Late complications, pseudoaneurysms, anastomosis becomes aneurysmal, graft infection, graft occlusion, we'll talk about that more later, renal failure. So we'll compare the two. Uh, compared to open aneurysm repair, EVAR is associated with which of the following postoperative outcomes? Um, higher mortality, well, that's unlikely. You're not going to do a less invasive procedure for a higher 30-day mortality. Um, higher two-year mortality, you know, that's uh, to, be, to be seen. You know, you have to look at the papers to know the answer to that. Um, higher risk of late rupture and um, increased surgeon time in the lounge. You know, it's uh, EVAR is a lot quicker. The answer is higher risk of late rupture in two-year um, mortality is the same. So um, it's because, uh, and why is it? Why is it that EVAR has a uh, rupture later? Because the initial mortality of EVAR is much lower and that benefit persists over two to three years, at which time then the late ruptures from EVARs occur um, and accumulate and the mortalities are about equivalent in two to three years of the two procedures. So higher upfront risk for the open and late risk for the EVAR. Why do EVARs rupture late? It's just because of their mechanism and um, inappropriate sizing um, and endoleak. So we'll just kind of go over why those things happen. So EVAR is pretty new. You know, really just FDA approved in 1999. Started in 1990 with Juan Perotti in Argentina. Um, and um, so you have to assess whether they're a good candidate for EVAR before deciding. Um, just to put one in. And I think probably the only criteria here that I'll really ask you is the neck length. Um, that's the length under the renal, lowest renal artery to the beginning of the aneurysm. As you can see here is labeled C. Um, and that's 15 millimeters for most devices. Now there are other devices that can go smaller, but that's a standard answer. And then it really can't be greater than 30 millimeters in diameter of the neck because there are no devices that wide. Um, you know, neck angulation is important. You don't want to kink the neck and have it leak. Um, and then if there's a lot of thrombus, it won't seal. And the common iliac arteries have to seal as well, not just the not just the aorta. And then you have to assess whether the hypogastrics are going to be open or you're going to occlude them. 
cause perineal ischemia if you include both hypogastrics. Um, the IMA, again, if they're assessed for whether it's adequate flow, even in an EVAR, you can still get colonic ischemia from an EVAR. And uh, you don't want to cover any accessory renals. And most importantly, you want to make sure the vessels are large enough to get the device there. Endoleak, this is predominantly why you get leak rupture. And the endoleak rate is pretty high, 15 to 30% but not all of them are going to cause rupture or even need to be fixed. So we'll go down which one is important and what, what are the different types. Type 1 is a critical fail. It means that there's a leak from either the proximal or the distal. You can see this graph here is just kind of floating. The aneurysm neck is large and conical, and so it's leaking. And then even distal on the right leg, it's, uh, it's leaking. So this one has got a critical fail that needs to get sealed, both ends, proximal and distal. Type 2 is a lumbar or IMA retrograde flow. Those are not dangerous, and those can be watched for surveillance and only fixed if the aneurysm sac continues to grow. Type 3 is a critical fail and needs to get fixed, and that is the components, because this is a modular graft, uh, the components came apart and needs to be sealed usually bridged with another stent. Graft porosity used to happen in the old core grafts. It doesn't happen really anymore on the end of the um, endologics graft. Endotension means they don't know what it is. So here's a um, another question. 58-year-old woman treated for ruptured aneurysm. She was treated with an EVAR. Over the initial 12-hour post-operative period, she developed increasing peak airway pressures on the ventilator and decreased urinary output, most likely, likely diagnosis, endoleak, hypovolemic shock, postoperative pneumonia, and abdominal compartment syndrome. Um, we'll just kind of cut to it. Abdominal compartment syndrome, you guys are all pretty familiar with it. Rupture, you always have to assess for compart compartment syndrome at the end. When the days of open, this wasn't important because they were already open. But with EVAR, you're not open to the abdomen, so you have to assess. Um, yeah, so ruptured abdominal aneurysms, you know, it's high mortality. You know, 50% of the make, people make it to the hospital alive. 50% survive the operations. The overall mortality of 75%. Um, classic triad abdominal pain, pulsatile abdominal mass, and hypotension in the ER. You should think aneurysm. If time permits, expedited CTA. Um, and then the rule here is permissive hypotension. So, um, you know, it's not to start transfusing because with more bleeding, um, you're going to just be feeding this in your and making them more coagulopathic. So it's really just transfusing if their um, end organ malperfusion, such as um, usually confusion in the ER, and then you start um, transfusing. Stat to the OR, you don't intubate until you're ready to either make your incision, you know, so that means prep and drape and lines and foley and everything with them awake, um, or if you're going at endovascular, um, you just do moderate sedation or local really is all you're doing, and then you're putting sheath in the groin and putting an occlusion balloon in the aorta, then you can intubate. Because as soon as you intubate, um, the patient codes if you don't have aortic control. And then EVAR, um, you don't want to take the time for your traditional EVAR. You'll just usually do an aorto-uni-iliac graft with the fem-fem bypass. I'll put a picture here so you know what it is. It's a tube from the aorta underneath the renal arteries to one iliac, and then you plug the other side, and then you do a fem-fem bypass. And this avoids the time needed for cannulating the other limb, which can be time-consuming in, in an unstable patient. This is very quick. And um, the complications are near 100% from a ruptured aneurysm, and then assess for abdominal compartment syndrome. Supercelia clamp. Um, I think this is just for you guys just to know it because that's always your bailout for bleeding in the abdomen. But um, there are the steps there. You can always look at it later. I can send you the slide. Um, here's one a little bit different. 64-year-old man presents with acute onset intrascapular tearing back pain. Images are shown. What's the best initial management? Intravenous vasodilator, intravenous beta blocker, intravenous pain control, immediate endovascular repair. Well, the focus on blood pressure here in the first two questions should tip you off. Any vascular thing that's managed with blood pressure is usually dissection. That is an 
aortic dissection. It's a type B. You can see the two lumens with the arrow there. So that it's impulse, anti-impulse control. So it's not blood pressure control, anti-impulse, which means getting the blood pressure and heart rate down. Getting the uh, blood pressure down and not the heart rate will make the problem worse. It will increase the um, um, the impulse to the aorta. So beta blockers are the, are the management. And I put in bold here, you know, this is the criteria that you want to meet when you have an aortic dissection, heart rate 60 to 80, and blood pressure 100 to 120 systolic. Um, so that's aortic dissection. You can see here, obviously, the type A's are going to go to cardiothoracic surgery, and those are anything that go proximal to the left subclavian. And type B is anything distal, which can mostly be managed medically. Um, if there's malperfusion of any of the um, vessels that are distal to or that are involved in the dissection, then that should be treated. Um, so sometimes it'll cover a renal or cover a mesenteric or cover an iliac cause ischemia of that organ, so you have to treat that. Your bleasure risk is high from TVAR because you're covering so many um, vessels that are feeding the spine. All right, so I think we're finishing up aneurysms here. Most complicated, uh, the, most, the complication most often associated with popliteal aneurysm, rupture, progressive claudication, nerve compression, thrombotic complications. Rupture, it can happen, it's very rare. Said uh, progressive claudication, not really um, because the vessel is just getting larger. Nerve compression can happen in these massive popliteal aneurysms, but most commonly thrombotic means they fill with thrombus from turbulent flow from the large aneurysm. Shallow leg, and it's actually a 50% um, uh, rate of limb loss once these um, popliteal aneurysms become symptomatic, and that's with treatment. So. When do you treat them? When they're greater than two centimeters, when they're asymptomatic. When they're symptomatic, um, uh, you treat them, um, meaning there's distal emboli usually. And usually when, when these patients um, present you know, a cold leg with the popliteal aneurysm, you want to thrombolyze first because they've usually trashed all of the tibial arteries. So you thrombolyze, and then you can decide what to do then. It's usually a bypass. Um, thrombolysis followed by stent has um, poor patency, so it's usually thrombolysis followed by, by, by bypass. Um, and just to know if the patient has a popliteal aneurysm, 50% of them have an abdominal aneurysm and 50% are bilateral. The, contra, the opposite of that is not true. Only 5% of people with abdominal aneurysms have popliteal aneurysms. So, um, so that's the treatment. You know, so symptomatic aneurysm, lysis, then bypass. Here's a picture of someone we did prone, and there's a massive popliteal aneurysm with the nerve splayed across it, and they have nerve compression and everything else. So this is the prone approach with that lazy S incision in the popliteal fossa. I don't know if you can see the marker there. Um, here's the other approaches. Medial approach is kind of your typical, you know, vascular surgeon approach. It's, the, you know, the um, supergeniculate and infrageniculate popliteal exposure medially, and then you just ligate the artery, you know, approximately distally, like in picture A, and then do a bypass with vein, preferably. Um, posterior approach, um, you can do, you know, that lazy S incision and directly cut down on the popliteal, and you can do an interposition graft with, um, you know, the graft patency is actually good, probably because it's so short, 90% patency, two years for PTFE. You can also use the SSV, which is right there. And then there's stenting. You can, you know, stent these if they're asymptomatic, and um, and you just need a good seal and some good tibial runoff. And you can put these flexible, self-expanding covered stents there. All right, moving on. 36-year-old uh, woman, remote history of left upper quadrant pain two weeks ago. She's got a 1.9 centimeter splenic artery aneurysm on CT, close to the hilum. Most significant characteristic in determining management is greatest diameter, smoking history, desire to become pregnant, anatomic location. There's some tempting ones here, you know, smoking, it's always a risk factor for vascular, large diameter, we like to fix things that are large diameter, um, anatomic location close to the hilum, but really what it is, is actually desire to become pregnant. So, um, splenic artery aneurysms have a very high rate of rupture, 
in women during delivery. Um, mortality is close to 75% or 70% for the mother and 75% for the fetus. So for that reason, um, in any woman of childbearing age, um, really should have serious consideration in repair of splenic artery aneurysms. You can treat them with coils, stents, and in this case, probably a splenectomy because it's so close to the hilum. Here's the, the incidence of aneurysms in the different splenic arteries. You can see splenic is highest 60%, hepatic 20%, and then all the other rare ones here. Now, occlusive disease, probably what we treat, what we treat mostly. We'll kind of move through these because you guys probably see them pretty frequently. This is a picture I did as a resident of the VA. It was a thoracoceliac SMA bypass, thoracoaorta, to um, celiac SMA retroperitoneal for mesenteric ischemia. So best medical therapy, right? Just get them to stop smoking. That's the hardest part. Um, so here's a question related to peripheral arterial disease, medical management, I guess. Um, so the, actually, this one is actually a DVT, but it gets you thinking about the medical management of the vascular disease. So unprovoked uh, DVT, patients started on Coumadin, fifth day of anticoagulation, she develops pain and erythema in the breast, the most likely underlying abnormality is related to Mondor's disease, right? That's superficial phlebitis of the breast. If you've got DVT, that sounds reasonable. Drug-induced hypersensitivity, protein C and S deficiency, Paget's disease. It's actually protein C and S deficiency because the uh, first thing, um, um, the half-life of protein C and S is very short prior to the other um, clotting factors. So you can actually get these skin necrosis uh, throughout the body, most commonly breast, buttocks, thighs, and penis. So it's um, it can be pretty severe. We don't really use a lot of coumadin anymore with all the DOAC, so. so medications, you guys know them for vascular, aspirin, plyotic, stephian. But for claudication, it's important because it's, you know, um, all the, the criteria for the different societies. You know, for PAD, patients should be started on celostazole unless they have heart failure. And that's um, really the best you know, treatment, particularly for um, claudication. Pentoxifilin is another option. Heparin, you're aware of it. And people sometimes ask, even the bolus and, and dose, you know, it's 100 units per kilogram, 100 units per kilogram bolus, and then infusion, 18 units per kilogram per hour. Try the PTT. How do you reverse it? With protamine, here's a picture of someone, you know, the, the source of protamine, it's a cation harvested from salmon sperm. So they always worry about the hypotension in patients. And they get it, particularly patients who used to be on older forms of insulin, but um, that's why we give protamine slowly. Coumadin, as we mentioned, blocks factors 2, 7, 9, and 10, and inhib or inhibits their synthesis, as well as CNS. Um, all right, so moving on to more peripheral arterial disease. This is a good question because it gets at shunting, which I think is almost always asked about. The use of carotid shunt is used to maintain cerebral perfusion during endarterectomy. That's true. The shunt would not be indicated in which of these patients. So 85-year-old male with a stump pressure of greater than 40 millimeters of mercury and a history of contralateral stroke. What is stump pressure? That's a way, basically, you should monitor your, contra, your perfusion to your um, intracranial perfusion during the case during the carotid because you are clamping one side. The worry is it can cause ischemia from clamping the carotid artery. So you could just shunt every single patient, uh, or you can selectively shunt people, which means you have to select them. You need a criteria to know how to select which patients to shunt and which not to. If the um, one way to do it is to clamp the internal carotid artery and then access it with an 18 gauge needle, um, distal to your clamp and hook it up to the A-line monitor on the anesthesia side. And if the pressure is greater than 40 millimeters of mercury, then um, shunt is not um, in, is not necessary it's, um, you know it's you can go ahead and proceed with your procedure um, the other way to do it is EEG so here's the next one 85 year old female contralateral less than 50 percent stenosis and EEG suppression that means that, um, that during the EEG you're getting slowing uh, of the waveforms and if that happens that indicates cerebral ischemia so that you should shunt that person 
um, a 55 year old male with a contralateral occlusion. And if the contralateral carotid is occluded and you're clamping the ipsilateral carotid, that means there's very little blood flow to the brain. You have to shunt in that situation. There's no need to even monitor anything, you just shunt. And then a 55 year old female with a CTA with a patent circle willis and a history of ipsilateral stroke. And that sounds good. It's a pre op CAT scan, shows this good flow. The problem is they have a stroke on the same side that you're working on. And that's also obligatory shunting in the situation of shunt, uh, in the situation of a um, stroke. Otherwise, you'll get a uh, massive reperfusion to the stroke area. Um, so the answer is the first one, 85-year-old with a normal stump pressure and a contralateral stroke. So it kind of gets at the all the idiosyncrasies of when to pick a shunt and when not to with that one question. Stroke, um, um, as you know, it's uh, often caused by the carotid distribution. 58% of strokes are from the carotid. You know, there are some rare other reasons to have carotid stenosis besides atherosclerosis, FMD, um, tachyosis, radiation arteritis. Um, you know, special considerations, most of these are managed um, semi-electively or, you know, within two to four weeks of stroke. Um, but if a patient has crescendo TIA or stroke and evolution or mobile thrombus, you might want to expedite your surgery. String sign is another reason to um, expedite it. If the carotid is occlusion, occluded, and there's really no surgery to do. It's already occluded up to the intracranial circulation, so no surgery needed for carotid occlusion. Um, what can you do? We kind of talked about this. Uh, when do you treat? Um, if they're symptomatic and they have a greater than 50% stenosis, surgery is indicated. If they're asymptomatic, greater than 70% stenosis, surgery is indicated still. A lot, of, a lot of evidence showing that aspirin and statin is also equally effective. Um, so carotid endarterectomy, um, we talked about the shunting. You can do a patch angioplasty, which is pretty typical, or an eversion endarterectomy. And then the numbers for the papers um, I wrote here for carotid endarterectomy, um, uh, five-year stroke rate for medical management or for surgery versus medical management. So in the symptomatic patient, greater than 70% stenosis, it's someone that you would definitely think about treating. If you manage these patients medically, they have a 29, 26% risk of stroke in five years. If you manage them surgically, it's a 9% risk of stroke, so 26 versus 9. And then if they have less stenosis, only 50 to 69 percent, they still get a benefit. Um, 22 percent stroke with medical, 15 percent stroke with surgical. So that's why NASA, that paper in the 80s, is so important to show that greater than 50 percent stenosis for symptoms we should treat. Asymptomatic is more controversial, but most people cite the ACAS, the asymptomatic carotid stenosis trial. Um, and uh, for greater than 60 percent stenosis, the stroke rate uh, medical is 11 and um, surgical is five. And carotid stenting, you know, the ways to do it, transfemoral, transcarotid, as long as the key is that you use embolic protection because of the emboli that result from the intervention and, and getting set up. All right, a uh, 68-year-old underwent a left carotid endarterectomy five days ago, had a right carotid endarterectomy just six weeks prior. Patients in the emergency room now came back with severe headache and one episode of left hand clumsiness. The risk factor associated with the clinical syndrome is smoking, diabetes, family history of aneurysms, severe bilateral carotid stenosis. So they're getting at, is this like a reocclusion of the carotid? You know, this is, this is uh, five days later. Um, is this emboli from the surgery five days later? Uh, or is this an aneurysm that now you've revascularized and has ruptured intracranial aneurysm, or is it something different? And yes, the answer is it's something different. It's specific to only carotids, um, and it's re hyperperfusion syndrome. So severe bilateral carotid stenosis is the risk factor for hyperperfusion syndrome. It means you, that you're releasing, uh, that you're increasing the blood flow to the brain by doing a carotid endarterectomy, and if people have severe bilateral carotid stenosis, the amounts of blood making it intracranial, intracranially now after surgery is increased. So you typically space these surgeries out three months apart so the brain can adjust to each of the surgeries. If you do them too close, 
what happens is the uh, intracranial pressure becomes too high and you get terrible headaches that then turn into frank intraparenchymal hemorrhage and, you know, and, um, and um, basically bleeding um, throughout the brain. And so the management is getting the blood pressure lower. Uh, another carotid question, um, patient, after a carotid endorectomy, patients noted to have drooping in the corner of the mouth. This is most likely is that an ipsilateral stroke, contralateral cerebellar stroke, injury to the marginal mandibular nerve, injury to the hypoglossal nerve. I'm sure most of you guys know it's actually just injury to the marginal mandibular nerve, not even um, transection of the nerve, because we often talk in the OR about not putting too much pressure on the mandible because the fifth nerve, um, uh, the mandibular branch of the fifth nerve crosses there and it causes drooping of the mouth. This is usually just temporary and incorrect. So it's not a stroke and not a reason to go to get a, you know, open the carotid again. It's just um, nerve compression. So all the complications from stroke we've pretty much talked about already. Uh, nerve injury, um, obviously heart attack, like any major vascular surgery, stroke, hematoma, hyperperfusion, hypotension, carotid patch infection. No, PAD, um, um, so claudication is, you know, the um, benign form of cramping in the calves, you guys know. Rest pain is near the beginning of critical ischemia, and it's metatarsalgia, pain in the forefoot that's worse, um, and that's relieved with dependent um, positioning, worse elevated, and they have dependent rubor. And then ultimately, tissue loss, which is uh, ulceration and gangrene. The thing is, this is not a spectrum. People with claudication often don't proceed to critical ischemia. They're almost two different groups of people. People with claudicate, people with critical ischemia. 75-year-old um, man with left foot pain. His foot is cool, uh, without pulses. He has normal strength and only minimal diminished sensation in his toes. He has a monophasic DP and a venous signal adjacent to this. This ischemia is classified by uh, someone else took control, huh? Uh, looks like someone else guest came in and took control of the, uh, of the slides. All right. We don't even see the share screen anymore. Um, Can you try to share again? Yeah, let me try again. Okay, it's just loading. Anyway, that question was getting, to, um, you know, acute limb ischemia. So a patient had um, sensory loss, pain, acute pain with sensory loss. And that's Rutherford 2A, so we can go over the... Is it showing now? Oh, here it comes. It's just loading again. And it's pH guest. Let's see. can see it again, right? Okay. Yep. Let's just go back to that one. Okay, so here's the answer. Yeah, so Rutherford 2A. So that's actually acute limb ischemia. So um, different than your chronic ischemia, which we were just talking about, claudication. Okay, 
So this is acute lumen ischemia. It comes from arterial emboli. It could be most commonly it's from a ruptured plaque. Second to that is atrial fibrillation causing cardioembolic disease. And then you can also have blue toe syndrome, which can come from either the heart or the vasculature. And those patients typically have pain, blue toe, but they still have palpable pedal pulses. So treatment, all of these patients are heparin drip. And then you want to consider the source and often either thrombolysis, thrombectomy, stent, bypass, or for Rutherford 3, acute lumen ischemia, it's just primary amputation because there's nothing to salvage. So let's go over acute lumen ischemia because it's important for you guys and also for the test. So Rutherford stage 1, limb is viable. There's just acute pain. There's no sensory motor loss, right? It can be fixed semi-urgently, semi-electively almost within, you know, a week. Um, 2A um, is someone that um, has uh, sensory loss, just minimal on the toes, no motor loss, right? That should be treated within 24 hours because it can progress then to 2B, which is then motor loss in, the, um, in just the toes with more sensory loss, usually on the whole foot and ankle. Um, so that's emergent. 2B is emergent. 3 is really they have profound motor loss, profound sensory loss, and there's cyanosis of the leg. This is not a leg that can be revascularized. Usually people would die from the reperfusion if this leg was reperfused and it's still a non-functional leg. So that's really just, you know, amputation when the patient um, is ready. So peripheral arterial disease, and then to Rutherford also classified the chronic limb ischemia from one to six, Rutherford one to six, so one to three is just different sever severities of claudication, mild, moderate, severe. And then once you get to four, rather than four, that's um, rest pain. And then five is minor tissue loss, and six is major tissue loss. Oh, and, and claudication is benign, you know, so it really doesn't need to be treated um, uh, unless the patient, you know, needs it for their lifestyle. Uh, two year, here's a question, two year primary patency of fem above knee pop bypass uh, with an autogenous vein is equivalent to which of these? Homograft, which is, you know, um, pretty exotic, PTFE above knee, um, autogenous vein bypass to the tibial and to the below knee with PTFE. It's actually the above knee bypass with vein and PTFE are equivalent. It's when you get below knee is when it really matters. And that's when vein is helpful. Um, Aeroelic occlusive disease, you know, often, you know, treated with walk therapy, medical management. You can put covered stents. Aero bifem bypass is still the gold standard with uh, even higher patency rates than that in five years um, in some, some reports. Um, iliofemoral bypass, if it's just isolated to the iliac artery. And then for a very sick patient, you know, axial bifemoral bypass, it's Really just it's not a deep abdominal surgery and then uh, fem fem bypass also very poor patency rate 60 percent so aerial bifem bypass you can do it end to end or end to side the only situation you can't do end to end in is if someone has like picture like number three both externally x are occluded because if you do an end to end you won't get any retrograde flow to the hypogastric arteries and buttock claudication perineal ischemia Infra-inguinal occlusive disease, you guys see pretty frequently probably, common from underdirectomy, fempop bypasses, and then the infragenicular arteries, you know, you really got to use single segment veins the best. Um, if there's no single segment vein, if you're talking about, in, you know, the distal popliteal and tibial vessels, then endovascular is equivalent to multi-segment and uh, prosthetic, but really vein is the best if they have one long vein. Teal entrapment is a non-atherosclerotic uh, peripheral uh, disease, and it's usually young patients, and it's due to this congenital medial deviation of the artery around the head of the gastrocnemius muscle. Really, just like it, you transect the head of the gastrocnemius muscle to repair this. There are great cases. Compartment syndrome um, can happen after acute limb ischemia, and this is, um, you know, um, how to release it, those dotted lines are where you make your incisions between the anterior and lateral compartments, um, and then also in the posterior, and then you go through the soleus and get to the posterior deep, and you know, 
it's really a clinical diagnosis. It's not, it's a syndrome, not an itis. So, uh, but you can put a striker needle in and measure the pressure. And if it's greater than 30 millimeters of mercury, then that's indicative of, of uh, compartment syndrome. And it's really pain out of proportion with passive movement and loss of sensation in the first web space because that anterior compartment is so susceptible. Um, how do we manage it? Um, I think probably getting to the end of the time here, so maybe skip some of the questions. We know about compartment syndrome, amputations. I don't think there's really too much to go over here. Graft infections is really removing the infected material and then bypassing in a clean plane. And air on CAT scan is how you diagnose it. There's air in the aorta. Yeah, you know, aortoenteric fistula is another graft infection um, and uh, difficult management, usually axial bifemoral bypass and explant of the graft and ligation of the aorta. That's a picture here of it. Thoracic outlet syndrome, uh, a lot of questions on it. It seems like the question that is asked most often is about venous. I'll just go over that one quickly and then we can finish up. Um, venous uh, thoracic outlet syndrome, so you can have compression of the nerve vein or artery, each causing a different problem. Venous thoracic outlet is usually a young athletic um, patient who's got um, acutely swollen arm on one side and um, uh, it's painful. So if it's the question says pain, the treatment is first percutaneous thrombolysis. Then you anticoagulate and you do surgery. I wait for the information to go down. I think the test says do it that admission. Um, I, I don't think it's a good idea just because the information. But first is percutaneous thrombolysis, then first rib resection um, if it's pain. If there's no pain, it's fine to do either way. You can do the lysis or you can just do the first rib resection. Um, I think you can't do the lysis after the first rib resection because they've just had open surgery. You can't give TPA then. Two, two approaches, transaxillary, how I do it, and supraclavicular the other way. And um, we'll end there. You guys can look up, I'll give you these slides, you can look at your own. All we have left is really fistulas, and there's really not that much to them. And then uh, the vascular trauma, I'm sure you'll get some trauma. Thank you, Dr. Bada. Thanks, Sue. Sorry for that rush through no all problem. the vascular. There's a lot of material. Um, thank you so much. And um, I'll share this uh, slide on the, our website and the, the rest of the people can have access to them too. Oh, I appreciate uh, it. Thank you. All right, thanks guys. Good morning. Hi, Dr. McManus, how are you? Good morning. Morning.